On today's show, we're talking short films with indie producer James Oxford, right here on No Rest for the Weekend. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, the show where we talk to the creators of independent film and series. I'm your host, Victoria Oliver. James Oxford is a producer and co-founder of Watergun Outlaw Productions. With his husband, Lance R. Marshall, he has produced a slate of short films which are quickly making their way up the film festival ladder. Our producer, Jason Godby, caught up with James on his recent visit to New York City to speak with him about the value of making and getting distribution for short films. Hi, it's Jason Godby for No Rest for the Weekend. With me today is producer and co-founder of Watergun Outlaw Productions, Mr. James Oxford. Welcome, James. Thank you for having me. So, James, thanks for coming in. Uh, James is a producer of uh, five short films, uh, which he and uh, his partner Lance Marshall have gotten distribution for. And I want to talk to him about uh, his career in producing. Um, So, if you can, just give me a bit about your background, how you came to producing, and uh, the origin story, uh, the origins of Watergun Outlaw Productions. Okay. Um, came at it in a very unconventional way. Um, actually, uh, my husband is an actor and a writer, and we had moved to New York uh, City in 2006, 2007, and uh, he had started uh, you know, auditioning for roles and doing some short films and, and feature films and not finding the kind of roles that he wanted. And so we finally decided in 2013 uh, just to take a script that he had written and just produce it ourselves. I come from a financial background. I have no uh, experience or training beforehand in film production, Um, but organized like a good Excel spreadsheet as any good producer does. And uh, so, yeah, we just kind of jumped in head first. And so this production company was a name he had come up with years ago but we officially incorporated it in 2013 so we could do that first film which was the demon deep in oklahoma and uh yeah we just went from there what was what was the learning curve how did you get um like if if you could uh, what what lessons have you learned kind of all along the way and what would you tell yourself like if you now if present day you could go back in time and tell past you uh, five films ago what would you tell yourself in terms of producing advice? You know, it's it's interesting, and this maybe comes across as arrogant, but I still look back, and I'm proud of the way that we approached it. I think the way we approached it was the correct way, which was we knew nothing about cameras. We knew nothing about sound. We knew nothing about lighting. We knew nothing about production insurance, location scouting. We knew none, none of it. And one of the benefits that I think both of us, Lance and I, both have is we have no fear of failure. So... Again, we just jumped directly into it, and so we just researched, and we have no issue with asking people questions. So we would, if there was something we didn't know, we would reach out to anybody we could find that could help us. And because of Lance's background in in working on all these various films up here in New York, we had met a lot of people. So we'd already kind of put a team together of people that he had met on other films that he really, really liked and that he knew would be good to work with. And so... Um, I think we'd, the only thing I would, I would tell myself is um, go cheaper, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, we, we did put more money than that was probably necessary to that first one, but that's okay. You know, it, 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 it is a learning curve, and we learned a lot of valuable things. And each film we do, we're able to obtain the same amount of quality and we're finding that we can do it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as we go along. So, and that probably comes with you know doing advances in technology mm-hmm. and yeah, um, getting um, and, and also working being able to work more efficiently. Yes. Um, so Lance is the director of the team. Yes. Um, and was he a first time director at that time? Yes. Okay. So you guys are both novices, kind of jumping into this, um, and I, I think it, it's good. I think it's good to do that. I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, your background in business, that helps you in terms of the producing organization. Um, for personally, I hate producing. Right. It's, it's, I think it's the worst job <laughs> ever. And uh, because it's, it can be very it's sort of thankless. Yes. Um, and, but you, you found benefits in it. You found, yeah. uh, you found ways to kind of express yourself artistically and, and be able to do what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And um, how does that partnership work with you and, and Lance? It works great. And the reason why is... Lance, like you, hates the production side of it. And I 
have zero desire to be an actor. I have zero desire to ever write. I have zero desire um, to direct. And so there's no overlap. So there is a very clear line of, and because we are married, we've been together 13 years now, there is a trust there that whatever his creative decisions are, they are what they are, and we go with that. And whatever my decisions are on the production side, he 100% trusts me to do that. And so as far everything outside of that, it's, it's, it comes down to the two of us. And so as long as, as, as we trust each other, it goes relatively smoothly. We've never really run into any big issues. So you got the 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 trust between the two of you and the relationship, which mm-hmm. I'm I'm you know I won't even get into ways that might be tested during <laughs> yeah. making of a yeah. film. Uh, that's a whole other podcast, probably a whole other talk. <laughs> but uh, the separation of church and state, yes. uh, so to speak. Yes. Um, the division of power is probably a good thing. Yep. Um, now you've done something. I wanted to talk to you about this um, because. There's sort of a debate right now about short films, mm-hmm. and is it are they worth doing? Is it I'm gonna you know I want to do a short film. Is it worth doing shorts? You've done something very difficult, um, which is get distribution for your shorts. Mm-hmm. How were you able to do that? You guys went the film festival route, right? We did. Well, we did a, a specific film festival, and because our films have gone to several fe- festivals all over the country and to other countries, but. When we did our second film, which was The Taking of Ezra Bodine, it got into what some people are familiar with. It's called the Shorts Corner at Cannes. Um, that is not a competition. And I'm very upfront. A lot of people will be like, my film got into Cannes. It's not the same thing as getting to the Short Corner. Short Corner is almost like a film market. And so it becomes part of a database. But as part of that, you are given access to all the phone numbers and all the emails and all the addresses of all the producers and uh, filmmakers and directors and all these very influential people that are going to be at the Cannes Film Festival. And that's invaluable information. Um, And so we did what I felt was the smart thing was we took all that information, which we got about a month before the festival, and I sent links to The Demon Deep in Oklahoma and The Taking of Ezra Bodine and composed an email and sent it to everyone that I felt I went through and kind of narrowed it down to about, you know, 50 people that I really thought. Like these are the people who, who might work with us. Yeah, that, that this film might resonate with or they may understand our market that we're looking for. And I reached out to them and so and set up meetings ahead of time. They had uh, an opportunity to look at our work and determine whether they wanted to meet with us or not. A lot of people go to the Cannes Short Corner and they wait till they get there, and they are literally out on the street trying to get people to come in and watch it on a computer. That's not going to happen. If you're in Cannes, the last thing you want to do is be is, uh, in a basement watching a film on a computer. So that's what we did, which I, I was happy that we did. And so we set up uh, several meetings and uh, just met with different people while we were there and talked about it because they'd already seen the films. They'd already kind of formed an opinion. And so we met with a distribution company there, and they went ahead and took both of those films and uh, distributed them for us. So um, that being said, it's it's still not a big money maker, but it's still a great way to get your work out there. The whole point we make this uh, our films is so that they get out there and so people see them. And um, and again, this was 2015. This was before Amazon had where you could self distribute on Amazon and things like that. So it was a big benefit for us at the time. And what was the benefit of actually, like, having the meetings and getting in there w- with people who had kind of been there and done that, no distribution? Because, you know, your, your eventual goal is you want to distribute your feature film mm-hmm. um, when, when that gets made. So what did you learn just by sitting with those folks um, and having those conversations? It teaches you the same thing you're going to need to know when you do have a feature film that you want to distribute, which is what kind of questions are they going to ask me? What kinds of information are they going to need to know? Because it's the same information. It doesn't matter if it's a 10-minute film or it's an hour-and-a-half film. They, It taught us so much about how to be prepared for that because when you've put money into a short film, you have a little bit of money that's on the line. When you put money into a feature film, you have a lot of money on the line. You do not want to walk in there blind. You do not want to walk in there unprepared. And so just like making the short film itself it prepared us greatly for what those interactions are going to be like 
So you and you were able to um, make those connections, and they like your work. Mm -hmm. So it, when you do come out with the next project and the next project, you have a list of go-to people that yes. you can that you can talk to and say, "Hey, what do you think about this? Do you want to help us distribute it?" Which is exactly what they said. Was you know they're like, "Keep us informed." You know, when you have new stuff coming out, let us know because they already liked what we had. So it stands to reason that they're going to like any future work. So. And you, f you found also the people that you fit with in yes. terms of, because you guys, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys are p pretty specific in genre. Very. Um, and how would you describe the films that you guys make? We call it dark drama. So s on the verge of thriller. They're not horror films. A lot of people try to classify them as horror mm -hmm. films because they are some twisted situations. But um, th yeah, dark drama is kind of what we've Sort of categorized. psychological thriller. I I exactly. watched the the demon uh, yes. demon in o demon in Oklahoma yep. uh, the other day, and I, I got a, a little bit of a Fincher vibe to it, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a Hitchcockian vibe to yep. it, um, and um, I thought I thought it was really I thought it was really good, and I thought you guys really made use of the location well, right? Um, and uh, I thought Lance was terrific in it. Um, and it was hard to believe that he was directing as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, what I really liked about it was how small it was. Because uh, there's only a couple of people in that. There's like two, three people. Three, yeah, three just, cast members. Um, and, which is a lot easier to manage. Uh, and you have basically like single location. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's like the magic bullet of pr production. Yeah. You know, it, especially if you don't have a huge budget or a lot of resources, keep it small, keep it simple. Um, yeah. You know, three people in one location uh, is a lot easier than, you know, 20 people in you know, five different places around the city or the yeah. globe or whatever. Yeah. Where was that filmed, incidentally? Uh, Hartwick, New York. So um, <clears throat> just on the other side of the Catskill Mountains. So um, all of our films take place usually in Texas or Oklahoma. Um, and upstate New York looks very similar to East Texas or Eastern Oklahoma. So it kind of works for us. And at this point, with the stuff that you guys have done, mm -hmm. um, you've gotten distribution for the shorts, which is like to me, that's like a little miracle. I, I, mm -hmm. You know, most people I know who make short films, uh, most people they they do just resume pieces, right? And nobody ever sees them. Yep. Um, because you've been able to do that, are to you are short films worth making? What, and and what would be your argument for or against that? Yeah. No, I think <clears throat> I think they're absolutely worth making, and I think they have always there's always been a bad stigma with uh shorts as being a waste of time or a waste of money um and <clears throat> and and frankly no you're not do not go into sh short filmmaking thinking you're going to make money off of them that's not the point but you have to have a long-term goal and if you don't then that's going to be a this is a difficult industry to be in no matter what in the best of circumstances it's difficult so, and, and a lot of it is talent and and skill some of it is random luck, and that's just the reality of it. And so with the short films, and you mentioned this before, is you do want to be smart about it. Think about what you're making. Don't, don't go into a short film with 20 locations and 100 people, and it's a period piece, and there's a car chase, and a car explodes. For the love of, of yeah, do not do that. that. That's not a smart way to spend your money and to use your time. So you want to really... Uh, hone your skills on what's the minimum number of a crew that you can get by with and still keep the quality. What is a simple story? So we, we always think about that when, when Lance is writing the scripts. He knows that in his mind. This is a short film. Do not have a bunch of locations. Keep it one so that with the limited money that we have to spend on it, we still have really high production value and really good quality. Um, and it's a great way to <clears throat> work with crew, uh, practice with new crew members, new cameras, new techniques, new actors. All of those things are important, and you do not want to be testing those things out on an expensive feature film. Because when we get the opportunity, hopefully in the very near future, to produce our feature film, we, again, just like meeting with the distributors, we want to be prepared. We don't want to go in there, get, get investors, and put that money in there and, and fail. And, and not produce a quality thing. So be smart about it. I, I don't think you should just throw tons and tons of money at short films, but I think you should always be doing them. If you're not doing a feature right now, then go shoot a short film. You literally, we, two of our films we shot in less than 48 hours each. 
and they cost almost no money at all. And they're and they're just as popular as the films that we've spent considerably more money on. So, I always find that the the trick is when you're doing it because I've made shorts as well, but um, it's like simple. You can do kind of simple but elegant. Mm-hmm. So you can do simple really well um, because complicated. The more complicated it is, the the harder it's going to be to make it look good. Right. Um, but <laughs> The, the trick is it's simple does not equal easy. Correct. So you have to write within all of these uh, limitations, and, and you have to think like a producer whenever you, when you put these things together. Um, you know, I, a lot of people call it resource filmmaking. You kind of take the, you know, oh, I have this location, I have these people, and you kind of write. Does Lance do that as well? Somewhat. He does with the actors for sure. Like he always, when he's writing a script, he already has all the actors in mind. And we are very, very fortunate to have just some brilliant actors in our circle. And so he always takes that in consideration. Outside of that, no. Because we definitely don't want to force um, the making of the film into a specific location. So he kind of lets that organically happen. But again, he keeps in mind that he keeps it simple. So it does still, at the end of the day, fall on me to then go out and try to make all that happen. So these specific locations, these specific uh, props and things like that. And anytime he reads a script to me, my brain is immediately just listen to every word he says, and I'm imagining what the place looks like. I'm listening every time he mentions a prop, it's in my head, and I'm thinking, how much would that cost, or where would I get that? So you do want to be aware of your resources and know what you have to work with. I would be hesitant if uh, to look at that first and then write. I would, I would try to write and then be like, okay, what kind of resources? And I think in the back of your mind, subconsciously, you will know without forcing it. What, what kind of, in making the shorts that you have, what, what were the biggest challenges for you? Because usually for the biggest challenge for me is location. Just trying to find a location that yeah. works and production design yeah. uh, and, and getting the art direction I want and, mm-hmm. and making it look good. Um, and sound is also always a conundrum. Yeah. But what, what kind of challenges have you guys faced doing doing these films? Yeah, I mean, location, like you said, is definitely uh, can be difficult. And specifically for ours, our films are not uh, New York City apartment where there's four billion of them. It's not uh, a coffee shop in some small town. It's an old farmhouse that needs to be in a specific state of disrepair in a specific setting with, you know, the landscape looks a certain way. So it's very uh, specific. And so I feel like I've gotten pretty good at finding those locations. And so we didn't struggle too much to find them. But again, that's where that luck comes into play, to be honest with you. Um, And when you find the right location, a lot of times the the set design is done for you, which we found. We, we've we rarely gone in and had to just do a lot of work. If you find that right location, it's usually designed the way that you were expecting it to be because it was it's the kind of house you needed, so it's probably going to be furnished for the most part the way you need. So it's take out a few things, move a couple of things, and that's about all we've had to do, to be honest. So you're, you're finding like a set in existence, so and, and you don't have to do a lot of ton of art direction. You don't have to do a ton of production right. design. Um, I think that's good. I mean, I've, I've worked that way myself, and I, I try to be pl- pretty minimalistic with it, yeah. um, especially if you because that's what's going to cost you money. Yeah, like people don't realize it. I also find the biggest, especially shooting in New York City, uh, the biggest problem I have is with sound on locations. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you know, because you get something that looks great, but it sounds terrible. Yeah, you know, there's traffic noises. There's a band that always plays down the street on Sundays. Um, you know, there's a crazy screaming person in the courtyard or dogs barking, and uh, it's just wreaks havoc with your dialogue track. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I wanted to ask you, and, and thank you for the insight, because I think everybody has problems with with those things, in particular set. And uh, you know, you guys, have, you guys have managed to find some great ones, mm-hmm. and and yeah. really lends a lot. Of, it's almost because in the in the demon in Oklahoma, that that set is almost a third character in the film. And that's literally everyone who's ever watched it has said that they're like that location that house in and of itself is a character in it and it was that was a living breathing mildly terrifying house right and in the seclusion of it too yeah. was it really that secluded or it was on 122 ma- acres oh my god in a, outside of a tiny tiny little farm town so you, you had the you had the because uh, the film one of the themes is isolation because mm-hmm. that character is isolated so you didn't have to fake that no, you we know. didn't. I will say, though, as a challenge, though, it was a working dairy farm at the time. 
So we did have the issue of the milking machines and the dealing with the sound with the tractors and, and things like that. So we did have to work around that a little bit. Working in seclusion has its own obstacles. <laughs> uh, I wanted to, the other thing I wanted to ask you, you mentioned um, you've, you've done five short films so far. The goal is to um, get a feature out there. Yep. Um, what is the progress of that and kind of what's the future for Oregon Outlaw? So um, after we did the last one, we finally really felt like we had, you know, people always say when you're making films or you're in this sort of industry, it's who you know. And that is true. The, the problem with that is, I think, that, and it used to scare us as well, is we're like, we don't know anybody. We didn't go to film school, which can help give you some connections. We do not grow up around families that have any sort of connection to anything that would have benefited us in any way. And the reality of it is, it's who you know, and you will meet those people along your journey. So as you're working on all these various short films, you're going to meet new people each time. You're going to have new people that come in and the more you surround yourself with really highly creative people, the more likely they're going to introduce you to more highly creative people. And that's how it's worked out for us. And so we've become well connected with some really talented, successful uh, people in the industry. And so now we have that feeling inside that, okay, now we're ready. We have the right people in place, the right connections in place to move forward. So we have a couple of feature scripts that we're bouncing around that we're looking at um the first one i'm not going to say the titles because i'll be honest it has swear words in it um so i don't want to offend anybody but um and we've actually what we've done is it, it's probably got about six or seven characters in it and we've already done um a lot of the marketing shots for it so we brought the actors in and we've set up a studio and we've done a lot of photo uh shoots with the characters we've thought a lot about marketing how do we market this how do we help people understand the world we're creating. I think that's that's a good point because a lot of people, when you go to make a film, you get so um, sort of hung up on the film and the material and getting everything to be right. You, people often forget, like, who's this movie for? Yeah. You know, who, who's going to watch this? Yeah. Uh, where's the audience for it? Mm -hmm. um, and c just considering that, bef I, because you could, in, in this experimentation phase, you could have come up with, Oh wait! There's nobody wants to see this. Right, right. Like, we yeah, love this, exactly. but outside of like our house, yeah. you know, nobody wants to see this movie. Yeah. Um, who who would your audience be, or how would you describe your audience? Uh, they are people who are very driven by performances. So there's not a lot of action in our films. There's a, not jump scares. There's not. It is some. If you love to sit down and you could listen to one actor talk for. 30 minutes straight and just give this amazing heart-wrenching gut-wrenching performance then you're hopefully going to love our films if you're looking for something that's a lot of action and movement and things and, and then then not necessarily so i think a lot of a lot of indie filmmakers seem to connect well with our films and even people outside of the of the indie world there are, there are some that really are intrigued by it um and i think it's just a different take on what like I said it's a very dark drama so we take a story that you would expect to be just your typical drama and we just give it kind of a, a dark twist so people like psychological thrillers and yeah. uh, um and and great performances so it's really character driven very, writing yes um so you mentioned you're working on this feature now mm -hmm. um and uh have you started the pre-production on it yet um so we have start like I said. So we've done all done a lot of the marketing, and so now we're working on the lookbook. So a lot of that marketing material will be used in the lookbook. And we have like, again, we like I said, we've connected ourselves with some people who um, have had some pretty uh, large success recently. That have had films with some large stars in them, and and have had uh, premieres all over the world. And we've sat down and talked to them like. What do you do? You know, we're at the we're we're wanting to get to this level now. How how are you approaching that? You know, there's things that we think of, but we don't know. Is that dated? Is that not an antiquated way? Because we were thinking that about the lookbook. You hear about a lookbook all the time, but we're like, do people still use those? Is that a way? And he's like, absolutely. He goes, I always do a lookbook, and so that's that's where we're at now. And then after that, we'll be setting down with. We have a few producers that we'll be talking to over the next couple of months, um, and see if we can get them on board. And if we do, then full sail ahead uh you mentioned uh not being uh, not not being afraid to fail right um was there any trepidation or any apprehension on your part going to the, the the bigger arena of features 
No. I, I have no fear of it. I mean, we've been excited about doing it for so long. And to be honest, if I was going to mortgage my house and sell my car and run up a bunch of credit cards, then yes, there would be fear there. But to be honest, we're, you know, we're going to be responsible about how we're going to do this. And um, we need to be able to make a film that is going to have the backing that it needs. And we're going to do that by connecting with the right kind of producers. And so, um, so yeah, we're not scared. I mean, I think that's gonna be exciting. Just those interactions alone, even if they don't come to fruition to making of a film, they're gonna be invaluable experiences and they're gonna help prepare us just for the next thing that we do. Thank you once again for joining us. I'd like to thank our guest, James Oxford. And if you'd like to see more from Behind the Rabbit Productions, visit our website, btrp.nyc. On behalf of Jason Godby and myself, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.